the Bible study tonight. I pray, Lord, that as your word comes, the word of life, the word of faith, it will generate and increase faith in every heart in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that faith will do its mighty work in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. I can see that we're still in James chapter 2. In James chapter 2, we're looking at verse 20 today. James chapter 2, reading from verse 20. And will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Verse 20. Uh, sorry, verse uh, 21. Was not Abraham a father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? 22. Then it says, Yes, thou, how faith wrought what with his works, and uh, by works was faith made perfect? 23. It tells us then that the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and was counted, imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Verse 24. In verse 24, ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. We're coming back to this passage because of the importance of faith and what it teaches us, what we need to learn, how well to live. We're talking about teaching about tonight, living by Abraham's delightsome faith, not Adam's dead faith. There's faith dynamic. There's faith alive. There's faith that justifies. There is faith that makes us to walk in the path of righteousness by the imputation of the righteousness of Christ unto us. On the other hand, there is faith that is dead. Faith without works, faith without obedience, faith without corresponding action. A kind of action that does not correspond with the faith that will process, that will profess. The faith that is dead, the faith that does not bring anything alive in our heart, in our action, that's dead faith. No action, no corresponding relationship, and no transformation, even though the man professes faith. And we see that in Adam, that he had dead faith. He knew there was God. He knew God created him. He knew God created Eve, his wife. He had no doubt about the power of God to create. He was not an atheist. He believed God, that God was a mighty one. And yet, he didn't follow through with that faith that he had in God. He was dead and he disobeyed the Lord. The kind of professed faith that disobeys the word of the Lord, that is not conscious of God in his action. That's dead faith. That's why we're looking at Abraham and Adam. Living faith, dynamic faith, working faith, proactive faith. And then Adam, negative, disobedient, dead faith. We're looking at three things here today. Number one, we're looking at the essential demonstration of Abraham's decisive faith. Number two, the eliminating, 
disobedience of Adam's dead faith. Number three is the entire dedication through Abraham's distinct faith. Let's look at number one. Number one, the essential demonstration of Abraham's decisive faith. Faith that decides on the side of God. Faith that decides to walk in line with the demand of the word of God. Faith that lives and walks and abides and does whatever God has commanded. Faith that gives God the first place, the exalted place. Faith that makes us lower ourselves and then to go beyond and obey the word of God. The essential demonstration of Abraham's decisive faith. We're looking at three things here. Number one, the proof of Abraham's obedient faith. That's the only kind of faith God recognizes. The faith that obeys him. The faith that surrenders to him. The faith that submits unto him. The faith that walks along the path of righteousness and obedience. Number two, the pattern of Abraham's observable faith. Everybody could observe when he left the all of Chaldees. Everybody could tell when he took everything he had and he went in the direction God had called him. Everybody could observe. Even when he was going to choose a wife for Isaac. And he told the servant, do not take my servants back where God has called me out. Everybody could observe. And the things God commanded that he did, they were not done in secret. When you believe God in truth, when you obey God in the truth, your life, your work, your action, your standing, your disposition, everything is observable. Number three, the possessors of Abraham's occupying faith. Occupied, occupied, doing something and doing what God had commanded the possessors we're talking about believers today we're talking about people who have come to know the lord and they are connected with him and converted by him and we can see what they possess abraham's occupying faith let's come to number one number one is the proof of abraham's obedient faith we're looking at Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive an inheritance, obeyed, that the word. He obeyed. Look at your life. Have you ever heard from God? Yes. Have you ever read the Bible? Yes. Do you know what he demands of his sinner before he comes into the kingdom? Yes, you know. Repent and believe ye the gospel. And when you come into the Lord, do you know what he commands? That we should be. We should live in righteousness by the righteousness of faith. We live in the kingdom knowing Hearing is one thing, doing it, obeying is the real thing. He obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went. That's faith. He relied on God. God knows what he's saying. He says what he means. He means what he says. He's called me out and yet he, doesn't, he did not know where he will be. He did not know the destination. He did not know the land 
that he and the descendants will possess. Yet he obeyed, not knowing whither he went. That's the face of obedience that God demands from us. In Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But God besang that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. That's what God expects, and that's what the early church did. Jerusalem, Rome, Philippi, Ephesus, the people that really knew the Lord, and they came to believe in the Lord, they obeyed from the heart that holy commandment delivered unto them. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, being then made free from sin, the sin of disobedience that had plagued our lives before we knew the Lord. When you know the Lord in reality, in small things, in big things, in public things, in private things, in things spiritual, in things social, in things ordinary, in things extraordinary, to prove that you have come to know the Lord, obedience to the word will tell ye became the servants of righteousness. It tells us in Romans chapter 16, reading from verse 26, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith obedience of faith anyone professing that I'm saved I'm born again I'm a child of God but there's no evidence of, of obedience of faith in his life it's not come to the true faith yet faith that brings salvation faith that brings conversion that faith works in our lives and makes us obedient the obedience of faith that's the proof we have living faith dynamic faith decisive faith in the Lord. Look at number two. Number two, we're looking at the pattern of Abraham's observable faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 9. Hebrews 11, verse 9. It says, By faith is sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country and it says dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob the heirs with him of the same promise verse 10 in verse 10 for he looked for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. Has God called him to a land here on earth that he had not known? That he did not even know how the land looked like? And he obeyed, knowing God cannot tell a lie. He knows what he's saying. He's prepared that place for me. And even though he had not known that land, seen that land, been in that land before he believed the Lord and he stood upon his word and he began the journey but then he looked beyond the pleasant land the promised land he looked beyond the earthly and earthly land and he says he believes 
There's another land in glory. Another land of glory. Another land over there beyond the sky. And then he looked for that city. He believed in that city and every step he took, every, everything he did, he lived like, I'm going to that better place. And to get there, I must be obedient unto the Lord. That's why it says that Abraham looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And it depended so much on that, that when there was argument between Abraham's uh, servants and Lord's servants, who to take this, who to take that, Abraham said, take whatever you want. I will take whatever is left. You see, he had faith in God. He didn't believe that by his own struggle, by his own fighting, he will have this and grab this or that. There are people who call themselves believers. They never submit to whatever God will do. Whatever God will say. If there is anything between him and the other fellow. He uses everything he can use in the world to bring down the other fellow so that he will get everything he wants. Does not face. Does not struggle. Does you fight and does you a kind of trample on other people so that they can have what they want above and beyond the other people? That's a line of uh, unbelief. Abraham had faith in God and left everything in the hand of God. Lot did not have the same faith. He wanted to grab and grab and grab. Eventually, he landed in Sodom. In um, Hebrews chapter 6, and I'm reading here from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 6, we're reading from verse 12. It says that she be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Inherit the promise. In the case of Abraham, it was a physical, earthly promise. He'll give him that land. And yet, he manifested patience. You know, impatience, when impatience uh, kinds of uh, get somebody, grab somebody. And he doesn't want to wait for the right time. He does not want to wait for his own time. He does not want to wait for anybody. He does not even want to wait for God. He must have it now. And he'll use all the tricks in the bag. He will use all the tricks in his mind to make sure that he has this. Might have to trample on other people. Push other people down, insult other people, assault other people, might have to hurt and injure other people, but he must have his way. That's an unbeliever. No patience, no faith in God. How did you get what you have now? Is it by the pattern and the practice? of impatience, unfaithfulness, struggling, fighting, destroying others that you might have what you are having. Be ye not slothful. Yes, work hard, but be followers of them who through faith, faith and patience inherit the promises. That he wants what he wants of you, and that is what he wants of me. Any other thing is the path of unbelief. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, for when God made promise to Abraham, 
because he could not swear. He could swear by no greater. He swore by himself, verse 14. In verse 14, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. Verse 15, in verse 15, and so after he had patiently endured. Think about that. Endurance goes along with patience. You want a problem solved. You want a promise fulfilled. You want to see your desire done, performed. Patience is necessary. The one that asks now, the wants to ask, get it now, and it doesn't come, that's not the way of faith. Patience. Impatient heart, be still. What though he tarries long? What though he does not come now? Be still, be still. Impatient heart, be still. Eager heart, my eager heart. I want to see that done. I'll be happy if this is done now. But it's not done now. My eager heart, be still. Anxious heart, anxious, anxious, anxious. I want this, I want this, I want that. But still, watch, walk, and pray. Just watch. Stay and stand for his own time. That's what the Lord expects. Endurance goes along with patience. And anybody who cannot endure does not have patience. I can't endure any pain. I can't endure any denial or delay. I want to be in control, in control of this, this, and that. I want to find that possession. I must have it now. Be still, patient heart, anxious heart, eager heart, be still. It will surely come. He may not come today, and yet my soul, he may, he may come. Whatever happens, whatever does not happen, after he had endured patiently, he obtained the promise that the way to wait for the Lord so that we can inherit what he has promised. We're looking at number three. Number three, the possessors of Abraham's occupying faith we're looking at hebrews chapter 11 and we're reading from verse 13 hebrews 11 verse 13 these all died in faith not having received the promises this all died in faith talking about abraham he didn't have the possession of the old land of Canaan that the Lord had promised him and promised his inherit his, um, his uh, progenitors or his, uh, his people that uh, followed him, his offspring. And yet he kept on believing, believing, believing until he died. It was later the nation of Israel possessed everything. Not only that, there were promises of, um, ex uh, of a spiritual experience, the full salvation and sanctification and the Holy Ghost baptism in the Old Testament that the prophets have spoken about. And they kept on believing, kept on believing, kept on believing until they died. It was after Christ came, many of those promises were now fulfilled. But they didn't give up. They didn't say they don't know whether God will ever do this. It says these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them. Seen them afar off and persuaded 
of them. It said and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Look at uh, the next verse there. The next verse uh, tells us what had happened. In verse uh, now, in verse 14, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. In verse 14, verse, verse 15 rather, it says, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came, they might, from which they came out, they might have had opportunity, temptation, thought, might to have returned, but no, they did not return. Why? They kept on in faith, and they kept on doing what God had called them to do. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, it says, but now they desire a better country. Oh, they said, even if we get all these ones here, even if we get and possess the pleasant, the promised land here, there's still a better one. And we're not going to jeopardize our chance of getting the better one by acting in a carnal way, in a, in a society way, by acting in the worldly way of struggling and fighting over here, over this one. No, we're going to remain focused on the Lord. We're going to remain faithful unto the Lord. And so it says that the reason why when they wanted that heavenly, heavenly passage, heavenly land, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. He has prepared for them a city, just like Christ assured us in my father's house, a many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again so that where I am there, you will be also. And then after that, it said, occupy till I come. And as we have faith in God, and we're looking for that future place, heavenly place, we so have that faith, and what he has given us to do here, while we're waiting for that time, we keep on, we're occupied until he comes. We're looking at 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 11, 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, fleshly drive, fleshly desires, inordinate affection, abstain from fleshly laws, fleshly struggles, so fleshly fight which war against the soul when we concentrate on impatiently hurriedly having the things of this world and wanting to satisfy our desires personal our desires precious to us and then we forget heaven and all we're struggling for now in our dangerous, delicate forgetfulness is the thing of this world, the war against the soul. But then it tells us in verse 12. In verse 12 it says, Having your conversation honest, proper, well placed among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak 
against you as evil doers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Verse 21. In verse 21, the Holy Spirit through Peter now shows us the life of Christ and the way we're to be occupied, what we're to be doing, and the way we ought to be planning and thinking just like Christ. And we do not deviate from the path of faith. Like many people are deviating in these last days, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, leaving us an example, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. In verse 22, in verse 22 it says, Who did no sin? That's an example for us. Whatever we want to get that will involve sin, we draw. Whatever we struggle after, whatever we want to achieve that will involve getting into sin, we drop. Who did no sin? Neither was guile found in his mouth. In verse 23, verse 23 says, Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. In little, little things, they throw something at you, me, and <laughs> not to throw that at you. You pick it up and throw back. That's not the way of faith. That's not the way of patience. That's not the way of following after the example of Christ, our Lord and Savior. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. How sorry we have to be. Anytime we're threatened, that we might not be allowed to get to where we're getting to. And then we we'll forget ourselves and we we'll threaten, threaten people. Maybe some people have a threatening posture, a threatening utterance, a threatening idea and a threatening personality. That's not Christ. When you want to develop threatening personality, the people will fear you so that you can have your way. That's not the way of faith. That's not the way of following after the example of Christ. Rather, you should pray and walk at that tendency and work at that propensity to threaten people by action, by word, by disposition, by your outlook. No, that's not the way of Christ. We're told that Christ, when he suffered, he threatened not, but he committed himself to him that judges righteously. Those who fight for themselves have forgotten that God is still on the throne. God does not get involved in the affairs of men anymore. So they can cause us pain and God does not see. They can hinder us and God does not see. And they can take a rise from us and God does not see. And because they have unbelief, they don't believe that God can see and God can defend them. That's why you have all this struggle and fighting and this and that. May the Lord deliver us. A good headquarters, amen. amen. Now, what are we to do? We're to keep occupied until he comes. Luke chapter 19. And we're reading from verse 10. It said, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that 
which was lost. Verse 13. In verse 13, and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. What does that mean? Be occupied in the same thing I have been occupied in. And now I'm leaving and the whole world is still there. And you go preach the gospel to every creature. Occupy till I come. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 and verse 9. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Verse 9. In verse 9, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrine. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meat, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Follow Christ, still the same, just a day today and forever. If Christ were to come to the earth today, what he will be doing was what he, is what he did when he was here, that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And since he has left us here, that should be a primary assignment. Yes, we do secular work so that we can feed. And if we have food and raiment, we should be satisfied. Not that we are running the rat race with the people of this world, and they will forget the occupation that Lord Christ, Savior, our Redeemer, has left for us to do, occupy till I come. Let's come to point number two now. Point number two, the eliminating disobedience of Adam's dead faith. Adam's dead faith. You know this story. We're looking at three things here. Number one, we're looking at expulsion from Eden's garden through deadly folly. Number two, elimination from the exalted gathering by dead faith. Number three, exemption from enabling grace after deadening of fall. We're coming to number one. Number one is the expulsion from Hedens Garden through deadly folly. Wasn't that foolish? When God had spoken to Adam and he had told him do not eat of this fruit. Only take all the others that are available for you. And then Satan came, as God indeed said, and he replied, yes, God has said, we must not eat, we must not even touch. My friend, are you going to touch something that you don't intend to eat? And he says, we should not eat, neither should we touch. And eventually, Satan in the serpent spoke to Eve and convinced her that God was wrong. That God had a kind of motive. He didn't want you to be like him. Touch it, eat it, take it, and you'll be like God. And because of no faith in God, no confidence in God, he took, she took that and ate. Apparently, Adam was not there. And when Adam now became present with her, 
she introduced it to Adam. Adam had directly from God. He shouldn't eat that thing. Again, dead faith. No obedience to God. No reliance on God. No confidence in God. He took the word of the woman. Because that's what she said. The woman, you gave me, uh, gave it to me and I did it. He took the word of the woman and dropped his conviction. And dropped his confidence in God. And dropped his obedience unto God. And then became naked. Adam, where are you? I had your voice in the garden, and I'm hiding myself because I am naked. Who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten of that fruit that I told you not to eat instead of saying, Yes, I did. I'm very sorry. I need forgiveness. I've gone astray. No. Pride will cover up. Pride will not confess. Pride will give excuse. Look at Job chapter 31 verse 33. Job 31 verse 33. If I covered my transgressions as Adam, by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. It's telling us, the scripture is telling us that what he did, he hid his iniquity, his sin, his transgression. He covered that up. And the transgression was hidden. And he didn't believe in God that God can see through. And God can tell what had happened. Those who have dead faith, they might know the word of God, knowing and doing are two different things. And when they have offended God, sinned against God, and they have allowed transgression and iniquity, and they know, and God challenges them, they don't repent, they do like Adam, they cover up and they hide. That's their folly. And because of that, he was expunged and he was expelled, was taken away out of that beautiful garden. And today, we shouldn't go the way of Adam. In Psalm 51, reading from verse 11, Psalm 51, verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12, in verse 12, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When we disobey the Lord, you might uh, try to say, I'm all right, I'm all right, but the salvation is gone. And the joy of salvation is gone. And the certainty of salvation is gone. You might, you know, cover up with a smile, with whatever disposition, whatever external expression. But in the sight of God, you are cast off. Now it says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me of thy right spirit. First Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 27. But I keep under my body. A Paul was a balanced believer, a balanced preacher, a balanced pastor, a balanced apostle. Well, he tried to set things in order. That was his calling. And he said, when I come, I will set everything in order. That's good. That's what we have to do. But at the same time, he endeavored to set things in order in his own personal life. 
if you believe the Lord, if you're not operating in dead faith, if you're not operating in assumption, you will work more on yourself than you try to work on other people. You will keep your life, you will keep your body, you will keep your members, you will keep the salvation you have, you'll keep everything in your life in order under the supervision and the power and the prevailing spirit of God rather than just here and there only keeping other people under. And you are so loose and you are not walking in the way of the Lord. That's not the way. If you are like that, you will be expelled from the kingdom of God. And you might still be boasting, I'm there, I'm there, but my friend, you are not there. Look at that. It says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Less that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. We're looking at number, number two here. Number two, elimination from the exalted gathering by dead faith. What does that mean? Elimination from the gathering of God's exalted people. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Now faith is the substance of things of fall, the evidence of things not seen. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. And then he now begins to mention them. The people that received a good report by faith. And the least should have started with Adam and Eve. But no, the least starts with Abel. And then goes on to Enoch. And then goes on to Noah. And then goes on to Abraham. And then goes on to Sarah and comes back to Abraham again. And then mentioned Isaac and Jacob and mentioned Joseph and mentioned them as they went on like that. But the name of Adam excluded. You see, that's uh, what unbelief does when somebody is concentrating uh, on other things and is not thinking about the faith he ought to manifest, the faith he ought to have. We should emphasize the faith, the, the obedience, and the observance of the word of God in our lives. However clever we are, however occupied we are, however zealous we are, if we do not have the faith that obeys the Lord will be excluded from the book of life. Will be excluded from the people that actually demonstrate their faith. That you can see the decisive faith they have in the Lord. Revelation chapter 20. We're reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 20. Reading from verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life. The people that are written in the book of life, they're the people that had that initial faith in God, repenting of their sins and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they continue. They continue in a practical, obedient faith in the Lord, like Abraham's faith, not like Adam's dead faith. We must continue in the obedience to the word of God if we actually have faith. That's why Jesus asked the question, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Shall he find faith in your heart? The faith 
that is obedient to the Lord, the faith that is observable by the Lord and by such, and the faith that is occupied in the Lord, in the things of the Lord. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And it says in Revelation 20, 15, and whosoever, that's which he what, whosoever, whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What keeps a name in the book of life is what brought us into the book of life, faith in Christ. The faith that brings us in, that same faith makes us to abide, makes us to remain in the Lord and in the book of life. And the faith, obedient faith, if it remains until he comes, then we'll be there. If, he, if the name does not remain in the book of life, we're sinning and sinning and sinning and struggling and, uh, you know, impatient and beat that down and strike that down, we lose our privilege in eternity. We're looking at number three. Number three, the ex exemption from enabling grace after deadening fall. The fall of Adam deadened his conscience. Even when God pronounced the judgment, is God. He said that. In the sweat of your face, you will now labor. Okay. And the ground will bring thorns and thistles. Okay. And even your wife, she will have pain in delivering children. Okay. Is God. And now you go out. And you are going to be tilling the ground and you will expect much little will come in or he didn't plead he didn't ask for forgiveness this man who knew the names of the animal who gave them names did he know that God is a God of love a God of mercy did he know that if we ask him and we repent and we say we're sorry did he know that he will pardon did he know the consequence of his sin that it is going to affect generation after generation? Why didn't he even seek for mercy from the God of love? Nothing like that. And because of that, he was exempted from enabling grace because the fall had deadened his conscience, deadened his heart. How are you, my friend? How are you, brother, sister? Are you dead and deadened that you are so immersed in your sin and the Lord speaks and you will not hear? Are you so deadened by the fall, by the backsliding that you are not able and you are not willing to plead before the Lord. We're looking at Genesis chapter 6, and I'm reading here from verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It tells us in verse 9, in verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and Noah walked with God verse 22 in verse 22 thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him so did he Noah found grace David found grace Old Testament uh, people found grace in the sight of the Lord. He will give them grace and glory. Nothing good will he withdraw, withhold from them that walk uprightly and righteously. This is the day of grace. But the grace does not just come if there's no soberness and if there's no sorrow for the sin 
we have committed and we have been committing. If there's no repentance, turning around from the sin, but you so respect God, you so honor God, you so believe God, you so fear God, that God will punish sin, though hands join with hands. God will punish sin. The person might sin so much, he lives 100 years and he feels there's nothing, but God requires that which is past. Don't be like Adam, falling but dead, falling but dead in it. Falling, but the conscience is seared with the hot iron. What will happen is, if that continues, expulsion will come from the kingdom. Elimination will come, exemption will come from those who receive grace. It tells us in Luke chapter 18, Reading from verse 8, Luke chapter 18, we're looking at verse 8 from the middle part there. It says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith, dynamic faith, decisive faith, obedient faith, submissive surrendered faith a kind of faith that makes you to so love god fear god and walk in the way of the lord nevertheless when the son of man cometh shall he find faith on the earth shall he find faith in your heart we're well, looking at number three now point number three we're looking at the entire dedication our entire dedication through Abraham's distinct faith distinct faith distinct faith not just faith for healing and there's no faith for salvation not just faith for earthly prosperity and there's no faith for living a righteous life. Not faith for things on earth, but faith for inheriting the kingdom. And then you show that by entire dedication through Abraham's distinct faith. In James chapter 2, reading here from verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works by appropriate action by obedience when he had offered i seek a son upon the altar look at three things here number one the supreme expression of abraham's work of faith expression supreme expression of that faith in God that he walked he wrought by faith as God demanded number two the sanctifying experience in Abraham's willingness through faith willingness there are some things the Lord might require of any of his children a son, a daughter, a level of commitment, a level of consecration that the Lord God of heaven might require from you, from me, and from everyone that names the name of the Lord. Just to test your willingness, that you're willing to do that. And then when you are now about to do it, that God says, Abraham, Abraham, that's all right. Don't lay your hand on the child. I was watching, testing your willingness to do what the Lord, God of heaven, expected you will do. And so we have 
the sanctifying experience in Abraham's willingness through faith. Number three is the sustained example of Abraham's walk by faith. Walk by faith. Walking in is not an experience of a moment. It's an experience that makes us go on and on and on living for the Lord. The sustained example of Abraham's walk by faith. Let's look at number one. Number one, the supreme expression of Abraham's work of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 17, Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, tested, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. His faith was tested. Your faith will be tested. Your expression will be tested. Your willingness, your yieldedness, your surrender, your submission to the Lord will be tested. Uh, people that go on in life as Christian, they just want to, uh, you know, they want to ride on the cloud. And they don't think any test can come, any trial can come. They don't think that God might demand something from them, that God is not going to take away from them, but God will say it as if this is for real. And God called Abraham after Ishmael had been sent away and God said, Abraham, he said, yes, here am I. Take that, your son, your only son, Isaac, and offer it him to me in the mount where I will show you. And the following morning, early in the morning, Abraham rose up. He took the child and he took the wood and everything. And servants followed him. And then he said, servants, stay here. I and this lad will go yonder, and then we, the two of us, will come back to you. That man had faith in resurrection. If I obey God, he has the power to raise Isaac from the dead. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Verse 19, it says, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. That's the faith God is expecting from us, that we were so lame that we have Abraham's work of faith. We're coming to number two here. Number two, the sanctifying experience in Abraham's willingness through faith. Holiness is uh, essential. Sanctification is essential. And there are people who profess, I'm sanctified. What is the proof of that sanctification? Any circumcision of heart, what is the proof? Any holiness in the heart, where is the proof? Any transparency in action, transparency in the inner man. Do people know what you are after, what you are doing, what you intend to do? If they hide and seek, there's no sanctification there. 
Is there hypocrisy there? There's no sanctification there. Is that is there pretense there? There's no sanctification there. Is there make believe? Make believe. I'm sanctified. I'm sanctified. I don't want any question. I don't want any preaching. I am sanctified. Hold on, my friend. Where is a willingness to give up anything and everything that God has demanded? In the case of Abraham, the Lord, circum is, the Lord told him about, about circumcision. And even though it was at that age, in Genesis chapter 17, yet he carried out that painful instruction because that's God's demand. But the Lord was looking forward not only to the circumcision of the flesh, the circumcision of the heart. Deuteronomy chapter 30, we're reading from verse 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed, so that you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that thou mayest live. John chapter 21, reading from verse 15. John 21, verse 15. So, when they are dying, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Actually, that's the question Abraham needed to consider. Lovest thou me more than your Isaac? That's the question we all need to consider. Is there anything on earth, anyone on earth, any activity on earth, any position on earth, Anything on earth that God is asking you, be sincere, be open. Do you have the sanctifying faith of Abraham's willingness? Do you love me more than this, more than this, more than that? That's the question is still asking today. And when our hearts are circumcised, when our hearts are sanctified, we love God above everything. And so Christ said, Lovest thou me more than these? He says unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Then he says unto him, Feed my lambs. It's actually telling Peter and telling us, if there's somebody we love above Christ, we don't have any right to be in the ministry, saying that we're serving the Lord and we're teaching the lambs, we're spreading the gospel, we're doing this or that. But what are we going to teach them? If we don't love Him, Christ, Savior, Lord, the Lord of glory. If we don't love him above everything, everyone on earth, we don't have any right feeding the lambs and the sheep of the Lord. Lovest thou me more than these? If we say yes, Lord, prove it by the expression of circumcision of heart. We're looking at number three. Number three, we're looking at the sustained example of Abraham's walk by faith. Romans chapter 4, reading from verse 12. In Romans chapter 4, reading from verse 12, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who walk also, who also walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. That we walk also in the steps 
of the faith of Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, it says, Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end for the purpose, to the intent, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the Lord, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, of the faith of Abraham, of the faith of Abraham, who is the faith or who who is the father of us all. As the Lord has spoken to us today, he wants us to know as New Testament believers that we need to live by faith, walk by faith, abide in the faith, and do everything. Consecration by faith, surrender by faith, submission by faith. And we need to keep on adding the virtues of Christ into our lives. That's what shows that we actually have a decisive faith, living faith, abiding faith, and a kind of faith that can be observable because it is obedient faith. Second Peter chapter 1. In Second Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. It said, Besides this, giving all diligence, it says, Add to your faith virtue. Faith is at the base. Faith is at the foundation. Faith is the beginning, the commencement of our relationship with the Lord. By faith, by grace through faith, we're saved. Purifying their hearts by faith. And also the Holy Ghost comes upon them that believe and obey the Lord. Faith is at the foundation. And then we add virtue. Can I ask, what are you adding to the faith you have that saves you? Are you adding virtue? And to virtue, knowledge. Are you adding knowledge? Do you love knowledge or do you reject the knowledge of the word of God that's what you add look at verse 6 in verse 6 it says and to knowledge temperance temperance is self-control no alcohol drinking no smoking of the mildest uh, thing and Everything you were used to before, not having anything to do with them anymore, you are able to control yourself. You're able to control your temperature. And it says we add temperance to knowledge and to temperance, patience. You're not, you know, so impatient in everything that now in life is like Little, little, little things. You get angry. You get upset. You are annoyed because that fellow is it, it, too slow for me. Do it in time. Do it quickly. Patience necessary. And it says to temperance, we add patience. And to patience, godliness. Godliness. We shouldn't forget that without holiness, no man will see the Lord. So, whatever we're hurrying for, whatever we're impatient for, whatever we're getting angry about, understand. If that thing happening takes godliness and holiness from you, you worship in vain, you study in vain, you work in vain. There must be holiness. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, it tells us, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. 
You want to be ready for the rapture? Add brotherly kindness. You are walking and you want people to go at your pace. Maybe that's all right. But add brotherly kindness. You consider this, I know. He's not going to obey me. I know. He's not going to stand where I stand. I will show him. Don't show him. Don't show her anything. Add brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity, love. Love to God from the depth of your heart. And love to people in all sincerity. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, for if these things be in you and abound and increase and become abundant, they make you that ye shall neither be barren spiritually nor unfruitful spiritually in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, it tells us, but he that lacketh these things, he that lacketh the faith and the virtue and the knowledge and the bodily kindness and lacketh the charity, he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and he has forgotten that he was forged from his old sins. We shouldn't be forgetful. Look at the next verse. In verse 10, it says, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Another amen there. Yeah. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Nobody gets to the kingdom of God by accident. Nobody enters heaven by accident. It's a deliberate choice that we have faith, living faith, decisive faith, obedient faith, observable faith, and occupying faith. That's how we get to heaven. And then that faith, we add virtue. We add knowledge. We add willingness. We add submissiveness. We add absolute surrender. And we walk with God. No fear of man. No favor that we get from anywhere that will make us look away from heaven. If all these things abide, then we enter abundantly and we enter excitedly into heaven in Jesus' name. I pray that everything we learn today will appear in your life, or preach in your life, and God will give you grace to be all you ought to be, and give you grace to enter that glorious place finally in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Make up your mind. You got saved. You came to a church like this for a purpose. Hold on to that purpose. and Let the grace of God increase in your life and your willingness to live your willingness to abide, let it be observable. Everybody can see. Let your light so shine before men. The day may see your good works, your life of faith, and glorify God, your Father, who is in heaven.